This is a video broadcast in respect of the Brussels II revised regulation as it relates to children aspects. My name is David Hodson. I'm an English solicitor, mediator, arbitrator, and part-time family court judge in London. I'm very grateful to my partner at the International Family Law Group, Anne Thomas, for all her help in respect of the notes and the preparation for this video broadcast. Brussels II was introduced in March 2001. It had dramatic changes in respect of divorce and divorce jurisdiction. However, it introduced some provisions regarding children. From the very first time of introduction, there was an awareness that it was relatively limited. There was a need for reform. And that reform came in the Brussels II revised regulation that came into force in March 2005. It made no difference to the divorce, divorce related to jurisdiction and similar matters. It made significant changes in respect of children. And it is these changes in which I shall be concerning uh, over the next uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes of this video broadcast. And they come into four chief categories. First of all, children who are covered by the regulation. Secondly, jurisdiction. Thirdly, recognition of orders, enforcement of orders. And fourthly, uh, the child abduction provisions that are then included. I start with children. In the first Brussels regulation, it was very limited, children of marriage and some other formal uh, registered relationships. It was much too narrow. And so the Brussels to revised regulation extends it to all children, whatever the state of the parental relationship. This is much overdue. It was much needed, a much wider extension. So it's worth looking at this particular time at uh, the uh, two concepts of parental responsibility and rights of custody. The crucial uh, definition throughout is parental responsibility. This is wider than it features in some national laws around Europe. For instance, in England, parental responsibility relates to the fundamental rights regarding a child's life. In the European context, uh, the EU law provides it should be much wider. It includes contact, access, custody, similar sorts of arrangements. Parental responsibility is the crucial part for it. However, another element is that of rights of custody, particularly when it comes to questions of child abduction. And again, that started with a fairly narrow definition. Some countries gave it only to one parent, gave it to the parent with a primary carer. Some other countries said it should be both parents. Some said it was only if they were married. A wide range of definitions. Increasingly now, in 2012, there seems to be a perception and a, a, an increasing awareness that it relates to any parent with any involvement, or any legal status, any day-to-day -day involvement in a child's life. If it can choose where the child is living, it can ch take a, a decisions regarding a child's life, it will then come within rights of custody. National laws are still different in some ways, but they are crucial. That is found in Article 2. So that is the definition of children. The second element uh, that was uh, introduced from the Brussels II revised regulation was jurisdiction. And again, this is uh, wider uh, than it was uh, previously. Increasingly now, around the world, there seems to be an acknowledgement, a tacit understanding that the primary jurisdiction in relation to children matters is habitual residence. Not nationality or domicile or simple presence, but habitual residence. And it's certainly worth saying in this respect that habitual residence in respect of children matters has quite a different definition as it does in relation to matters of status, divorce, and similar legislation. There it's looked at settled intent. Where it concerns children, there is a much broader uh, definition. Why? Well, in part, it's because children have to follow the parent. But which parent, if the both parents are on the move? What is the habitual residence of a child? 
and each country, each jurisdiction has its own case law. There is no building up a good body of European Union, a European Court of Justice case law on the habitual residence of the child. And this, we're finding this uh, across the world uh, beyond uh, the pure civil law and common law jurisdictions in the European Union across the world generally. So the heart of this is habitual residence. But there are some other definitions, some other provisions as to jurisdiction which we find in the Brussels II regulation. One of these is if it's uh, uh, ancillary to divorce proceedings or status of the parties' proceedings, then there will be jurisdiction. This may conflict with habitual residence, and there are provisions set out within Brussels II regulation as to what happens uh, uh, for the two. There is continuing jurisdiction of existing proceedings. There is a small element of list pendens first to issue found in the Brussels II aspects regarding children, but certainly nothing like what we find in the Brussels II elements regarding divorce and primary jurisdiction. There's another element uh, regarding uh, substantial uh, connection uh, between the child and uh, uh, the jurisdiction. There are a series of cascading uh, jurisdictional elements in Brussels too, each of which need to be looked at. The primary one is in Article 8, and then it goes down through 9, 10, 11, 12, to various other uh, ancillary aspects of jurisdiction under the primacy, often, of the habitual residence. And again, practitioners and judges need to look at these elements uh, for whether jurisdiction exists. But there's one extra element that was found in Brussels II revised regarding children, which we don't find in any of the other European Union legislation, and I think in this respect of Brussels II regarding divorce, and also the European Union maintenance regulation. And that simply says that if a court is seized with matters regarding a child under the Brussels II revised regulation, the court is able to transfer the proceedings to a court which is better placed, the words of the legislation, to deal with that matter in respect of a child. There must, of course, be a substantial connection. Now, this doesn't allow sort of exotic choices uh, uh, in any way. There's got to be a, a, a connection. But nevertheless, if a court considers that uh, another court is better placed, there can be a transfer. And a number of these transfers have actually taken place around the European Union since March 2005 when this legislation came in. There are certain provisions. There are the provisions whereby one state can ask another state to transfer the proceedings to itself. There are provisions where one state can invite another state, a member state, to take the proceedings on the basis that it is better placed. And there is an increasing body of case law uh, that actually uh, describes when a country is or is not better placed. This is a wonderful piece uh, uh, within the legislation. We don't find it uh, in the context of divorce. We don't find it in the context of uh, uh, maintenance proceedings. We do find it here in the context of children proceedings, and so we should. Uh, the, the jurisdictional elements are, are pretty sound, they're pretty straightforward in the Brussels to revise regarding children, but there are still some elements where one simply says that other court is better placed, that other court should receive the transfer. And so the transfer of these proceedings uh, is an important and valuable element, discretionary but valuable. So we've looked at children, we've looked at jurisdiction. The third element is the recognition and enforcement of orders. And this, I suppose, goes to the heart of European Union legislation in family and civil matters. The whole idea that across the European Union of, what is it, 510 million citizens now across the European Union to be enlarged in the next year, 18 months or so, possibly, there must be a recognition of orders made by competent authorities whether that is by courts or, 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 or similar or organisations. What is made in one member state should prevail in another member state. And in respect of children, it's important to uh, divide between two particular categories. Uh, there are the orders regarding return of a child in the context of child abduction and orders regarding contact of a child. And there are the, all the other orders, and what may be called a custody, a residence, a, a orders similar uh, to that. And I'll start with the first two, because they are central. 
This is an order for return of a child. A court makes an order that says to another member state, you shall return the child uh, to this country um, uh, from which the child has been taken. In the context of child abduction, as we shall see in a few minutes, but a return order, very, very important. And the second in this category, and there are only two in this category at the present time, is contact orders. The court makes an order in a member state uh, that uh, um, uh, perhaps a father shall have contact with the child on particular times and particular events. That contact order can be recognised uh, and enforced right across Europe. And so we have this situation with these two orders, contact orders, return orders, automatically recognised across the European Union, automatically enforced across the European Union. There are very narrow grounds for non-recognition. By and large, they will not apply in the vast majority of cases. Automatic recognition, automatic enforcement, no system of registration, having to go across to another country and, and go through a halfway procedure uh, to, to obtain a sort of registration, a local order. An order made in one European Union uh, state is automatically uh, recognised and enforced for contact and return orders. And in the annexes to a Brussels II regulation, one can see uh, the forms that have to be completed in one's own home country for that uh, uh, process uh, to take place. And then there are the other children orders, residency orders, um, specific issues orders, uh, uh, other orders that would be made apart from contact, apart from return. And these are by and large automatically recognised, but so for the enforcement process, they need a form of registration executeur. Uh, process uh, uh, varies between country and country. Most countries it's fairly simple, it's straightforward, but it does allow some element of objection uh, at that particular stage in a very narrow sense. And again, refer to the Brussels II regulation revised as to the narrow ways in which there could be some uh, claims uh, against reg uh, registration. But again, it's very helpful. Brussels II revised is very good in this regard for children orders, children arrangements in one country to be recognized and enforced in another. So that's the third element of the Brussels II revised. And the fourth goes to the child abduction uh, uh, legislation. And it's not that the uh, Brussels uh, policy makers are trying to supplant or replace uh, the Hague Convention on Child Abduction. They shouldn't do so, uh, they must not do so. It's such a fundamental piece of a cross-border legislation. About 18 nations already signed up. Some important nations are going to be signing up, hopefully, over the next uh, 12, 15 months or so. Uh, but it's so important. But what the EU uh, uh, policymakers said, here we are, we're in a combined uh, group of uh, countries within the European Union, what more can we do to strengthen uh, the Hague Convention, the child abduction provisions? And they did so primarily in several ways. One of them is as to timetable. And they said, Brussels to revise, that these cases must be resolved from beginning to end, from beginning at the start of the application to the end, including the appeal process, it would seem, it, within six weeks. And there are some countries, and England uh, is one of these, uh, that has responded very vigorously and has said, yes, we will allow this to happen. Um, we, and and uh, other court processes have, have changed, uh, and other cases have basically been shoved out of the way to comply with this six-week time period. I'm bound to say that there is a perception from uh, the British Isles that there are some countries around Europe which are just ignoring this six-week uh, time period. Uh, there's little prospect of it being well, sometimes within six months. Uh, there have been a couple of cases that have gone to the European uh, Court of Justice where it's clearly obvious that countries have been so slow. We're talking years rather than weeks here. Um, and there needs to be, in the opinion of some of us, much greater policing by the European Union. They can't simply lay this down and say there's got to be a six-week timetable for return of the child or resolution of whether the child will or not be returned without doing something about those countries which are totally ignoring it. Family law specialists, judges around Europe, we know which of the countries are where there will be great difficulties. But this six-week period is there uh, and, and should be adhered to and it can be the subject of complaint one nation to another if it is not adhered to. 
Another element that has been brought in is what I've already referred to as the automatic recognition of return orders. If a child is taken from one country to another country, the child from which that, uh, the country from which the child has been taken, uh, the country of origin, the state of origin, um, if you'd like to describe it, retains jurisdiction. There can be no gaining of habitual residence in another country when it is the subject of an abduction. The first country, the country from which the child has left, maintains the jurisdiction and moreover can make an order for return. Uh, that is a, an order saying this child must be returned to this state. Uh, and that is a, a requirement and it is automatically recognised. Another quite interesting development uh, within the child abduction aspects of the Brussels II revised is what is known as a trumping order. This is curious. Uh, it hasn't been used uh, very frequently around Europe, but it has been used and sometimes to very good effect. And it arises in the following fashion. A child is taken from country A to country B. Country A says that child must be returned. It says the child from which it, uh, the country from which it was taken uh, has still got jurisdiction. That was a, a, an abduction in the uh, uh, meaning of the child abduction uh, legislation. Wrongful removal, wrongful retention. The child must come back. And country B, to which the child has been taken, considers the matter and then doesn't make a return order. Maybe it breaches the legislation entirely and undertakes a full welfare test and makes orders regarding the long-term uh, uh, parenting of the child. Whatever happens, country B doesn't make a return order. It then swings back to country A, and in a process, a timetable, a procedure set out in the Brussels II regulation, country A can effectively make a trumping order to demand the return of the child overcoming the non-return order of country B and effectively demanding the return of the child. And that trumping order does what it says, it trumps the non-return order. It hasn't been made uh, very often, it's obviously a very sensitive order to be made uh, within the overall context, but it is there and it is being used from time to time. I would suggest that within the uh, European Judicial Network, uh, uh, an invaluable network of judges uh, where they speak to each other, there's a, a nominated judge in each jurisdiction, I would suspect that before a trumping order is made, there should be some contact through the European Judicial Network. It's a pretty strong order to make, but it is there and it can be made. And the last element uh, in this category regarding child abduction is that the European Union said, well, there are a number of defences uh, to the uh, Hague child abduction, and one of them is the, um, the grave hardship of the child in the country to which the child will be returning. And we know this is used quite a lot around the world amongst the Hague Convention uh, uh, countries. The argument goes the child is going back to such an appalling situation, uh, whether it's a risk of violence or where it's bad housing, insufficient financial support, a number of these circumstances, and worse, uh, where the, the party says, I should not have to go back uh, because of uh, uh, these uh, uh, sorts of objections, the grave hardship, uh, the intolerability of it. And the European Union looked at how this was working across uh, uh, the European Union, um, uh, and so Brussels said, we don't think this is appropriate anymore within Europe. And so it's been abolished as a Hague Convention defence within the European Union between European Union countries. Yes, some of us have some misgivings, but I think overall this must be correct and right and fair within the scheme. There must, as I say, be much greater policing by the European Union of how the child abduction regime within the Brussels II regulation is working across Europe but generally this principle must be the right one. And so one draws back in conclusion and says, yes, there's been some uh, uh, regulations that have come from the European Union which have caused much concern. Brussels too, in relation to divorce, causes massive concern. The maintenance regulation is a complex piece of legislation, but there's very good legislation as well. The service regulation, 
the legal aid provisions, uh, um, uh, the taking of evidence, much good. And into that category must come classically the children elements of the Brussels II revised. This is good news for children around Europe and it is a workable uh, law, procedure and process for all family lawyers and judges working across the European Union. Brussels must be congratulated on having done a very good job for the children of the European Union in this piece of legislation.